Hi and welcome to France in Focus. I'm Luke Brown. These are our top stories. The opposition in disarray. The UMP flounders in the European elections and heads roll two out the party in the wake of an embezzlement scandal. Is she set to become France's new political centre of gravity? Marine Le Pen's far-right national front sends shockwaves from Paris to Brussels and learning the lessons of a costly failure. Ahead of the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, we'll be taking a closer look at the 1942 raid uh, on Dieppe that ended in disaster but was a tragic dress rehearsal for the Normandy landings. We start this week in front of UMP party headquarters. The Conservatives have been stuck in opposition for the past two years, but they've been unable to capitalise on the government's own mounting problems. Indeed, mired in their own scandals, this week the party boss was forced to quit. Let's take a look why. French opposition party, the UMP, has been thrown into the spotlight. Investigations are underway to examine if a communication firm used by the party were forced into falsifying invoices. In France, political parties are allowed to spend a maximum of 22.5 million euros on presidential campaigns, even if they have additional funds. The UMP overran 11 million during the unsuccessful re-election bid of Nicolas Sarkozy in 2012. Investigators allege communication firm Big Million was used to cover up the overspending. The firm organized large-scale events during the campaign, and according to its lawyer, Big Million was used to falsify invoices for conferences and conventions, which never took place. There were false invoices in the sense that Pygmalion was never used for a convention by the UMP. What's been built under the guise of convention were Nicolas Sarkozy's rallies. The allegations have sent the UMP into a tailspin. Pygmalion's two founders are said to be close to party leader Jean-François Copé. On Tuesday, he was forced to resign while continuing to plead his innocence. These were my colleagues, people who have betrayed my trust, whatever the motive was. I'm asking the French people to believe me when I say that my integrity is totally intact. The Big Malian affair has further entered the UMP, a party in recovery from its poor performance in the European parliamentary elections. Members of the party are equally stunned their names have been linked to the scandal. It's a serious affair. First, they stole my name. They stole my name and associated it with something that's most likely fraudulent. My name and then a bill for 299,000 euros for something I'm not part of. While the investigation continues, the UMP will be led by three former French prime ministers until a leader is elected in October. Now, after the local elections in March and the European vote in May, one of the biggest political stories here in France has been the seemingly unstoppable rise of the far-right National Front. But how has Marine Le Pen succeeded in turning what was once a party of pariahs into one that's not just rocking the boat, but increasingly setting the political agenda? Let's take a look. Marine Le Pen has taken the National Front to levels her father never reached. But Jean-Marie Le Pen takes credit for his daughter's success. It's just the results of a movement started 42 years ago. The National Front was created in 1972 with Jean-Marie Le Pen as its first president. It unified a variety of small nationalist parties with one common enemy, immigration. The country is worried about immigration. The first electoral breakthrough came more than a decade later with the 1983 municipal elections and in 1986, the National Front won 35 seats in Parliament. But the party's political gains came with its leaders' increasingly scandalous comments, especially regarding the use of gas chambers during the Holocaust. I believe it's a footnote to the history of World War II. Despite being rejected by many as a racist party, the National Front shocked the nation in 2002 when Jean-Marie Le Pen reached the second round of the presidential election. In 2011, his daughter Marine took over and sought to transform the National Front into a mainstream party by softening its xenophobic image. The National Front that I will lead will be a renewed, open and efficient party. She expelled openly racist members, banned skinheads from her rallies and fought to shed the party's extreme right label. It's not a PR stunt. The issue is that we're being called a derogatory term. We're the National Front, not the extreme right. 
With strong showings in the latest municipal and European elections, the strategy seems to have paid off. But many still see Marine Le Pen as just a sugar-coated version of her father, standing for the same things, anti-immigration, anti-EU and anti-globalization. And her next goal, doing better than him and winning the presidency. Game, set and cash. This week, France's sports lovers will be focusing on the orange clay of Roland Garros. For the victors, it's certainly a money spinner. Top prize, 1.65 million euros. Even those defeated in the first round take home a cheque for 24,000 euros. So just how much of a financial attraction is the French Open? The French Open, a temple for tennis lovers and a money-making champion. With 460,000 spectators and places selling for up to 175 euros, ticket sales alone bring in over 25 million euros per year. The Roland Garros tournament is also a major merchandising brand with a 7,600,000 euro turnover. Meanwhile, around 20 sponsors pour in more than 2 billion euros to have their logo displayed courtside, a move that's deemed a winning strategy. The brand is visible for more than half an hour for every hour of airtime. That's huge. It represents 5 million advertising slots for BNP Paribas. Yet broadcasting makes the biggest impact on the Roland Garros budget baseline. With 3 billion viewers worldwide, the sale of television rights nets organizers more than 62 million euros. France's national broadcaster serves up almost a third of that figure, targeting a healthy return on investment. Every time players change ends, you can show commercials, so you can do a lot of advertising, and it really adds up. It's a win-win situation. The tournament's turnover stands at over 175 million euros, more than for the Australian Open, but behind Wimbledon. The takings pay for the site's upkeep, while also representing the main source of funding for French tennis. Through a whole range of activities at the national level, like our regional centres, leagues, local committees and clubs, 50 million euros is channelled back into French tennis. With the tournament in good financial form, organisers are ploughing profits into a 340 million euro extension, the price to pay to remain in the same league as the world's other Grand Slam tournaments. We're here at one of the biggest memorials to the victims of the Second World War in the Paris region. On June 6th, it'll be the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy of 1944. The success of that military operation in part due to the lessons learned from an earlier failure. The Allied raid on Dieppe in 1942, spearheaded by Canadian troops, cost over a thousand lives in just a few hours. A series of mishaps and blunders, though, uh, leading to what was supposed to be a surprise assault turning into a humiliating defeat. 19th August 1942. At the height of Germany's occupation of France, Allied forces launched a seaborne raid on the French port of Dieppe. 250 ships, 800 aircraft and 6,000 troops were involved. The aim of the mission? To test German coastal defence. Allied forces were unprepared and the operation turned into a carnage. Marcel Diologen was a child at the time. The incident has intrigued and even haunted him. For Diologen, Dieppe was not the best location to conduct the raid. Dieppe is surrounded by cliffs, and the beach is very wide, so the fortifications ensured that the troops couldn't reach the land. Out of the 27 tanks, only 7 to 8 could reach the esplanade where there's grass. In addition to enemy fire, another problem arose. The pebble surface of the beach was not conducive for the tracks of the tanks. They were stripped away as they were driven onto the beach. And while the tanks became sitting ducks for German guns, other dangers arose. On the 19th of August, mortar that landed on the beach broke the pebbles into smaller parts. And then those became weapons on their own because they ricocheted and hit the soldiers. A pebble that's been broken is as sharp as a razor blade. The account of the operation was disastrous. In nine hours of combat, over 1,000 mainly Canadian troops were killed. The area today still pays tribute to their sacrifice. A group of French soldiers also contributed to the raid. Gérard Cadeau met two of them. He was 14 years old at the time. Around 7 o'clock, I saw two officers that got down with revolvers in their hands. 
I was on the verge of crying, because if you show a child of 14 years of age a revolver, well, it's scary. Then they spoke to my father and asked if he didn't want to leave and move to England. My father replied and said, you speak French? And he said, I am French. The two French soldiers were part of the famous Commando Kiefer that learned from the experience and went on to Normandy two years later. The fiasco of Dieppe taught Allies valuable lessons. They would no longer try and raid pebble beaches, nor would they try and attack a heavily fortified port. That's all for this week's uh, France in Focus, but there's more news coming up here at France 24, so do stay tuned.